Laura, thanks so much for joining today's podcast. Laura is uh, the founder um, and the CEO of Crothers Consulting. It's a human resources uh, consulting firm. Uh, Laura, so happy to have you on the call. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for inviting me, Andrew. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, well, I wanted to quickly check with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Crothers Consulting, your founding story? Why did you start the company? Yeah. So I actually started the company. It was a work-life balance thing for me. I had worked in corporate America for many years and I had small children. They were of the age where you needed to run them around after school. So daycare was easier to have them when I was working, but um, school age, it became harder. And so I decided I would go out and hang a shingle at that point to just keep myself a little bit busy. And um, it's been amazing. It's 12 years ago and taking a look from 12 years to now at our growth. And now I've got a team of 25. We're in three different verticals, um, HR, leadership and coaching. And it's it's been it's been a fun ride. I didn't think I was going to be an entrepreneur and a CEO of a company. I just thought it was going to be a little work life balance for me while my kids grew up. Great. When you started the company, um, did you envision today, twelve years from now, your company was going to be in this size and this form doing this? Did you know what were your expectations when you started the company? Yeah, when I started, I just wanted um, balance. So I thought, yeah, maybe in 10 years, I would have um, an admin to help me or, you know, a junior generalist. Um, and I was thinking at this point, my youngest is actually about to go to college. So I was thinking now I would probably be returning to corporate America for a big global job. So that was kind of my vision. And Obviously, that's kind of been flipped on its head as we've had 60% growth every year for the past bunch of years. And this is fun. Like, I love this. And now I would never go back to corporate America. I like running the company and I've got an amazing team. And so I've got a very different end game in mind now than what I did 12 years ago. Amazing. That was my next question. Would you ever consider going back to corporate America? And you answered it there. But what's your advice to young uh, young mothers uh, considering starting their own business? So I, for me, it's been a wonderful experience. I think that um, it takes a while to get going. The first few years were really slow. I used to joke around and say, if I could get paid for every coffee that I had to get to know people, I would have been rich. <laughs> You know, I had so many good coffees and gave lots of advice during those coffees. Um, but, you know, the first few years were slow and then it just really took off after that. So I'd say if you've got the ability to be patient um, and not need a ton of income flow, like you don't go from what you made in corporate America to doing your own thing, making that kind of money right away. It takes a while. That's right. That's right. That's right. And the support of the family as well, uh, right? You have to have a, a support system in place that uh, kind of gives you the environment to thrive and gives you the time to make it. Right. You know, for me, part of it was also getting to know that when you met new people, it wasn't the first time you and I met Andrew that we would remember each other. It took seven touches. And so it's a lot of time spent building relationships. Right someone who would then refer you to their client because they'd remember your name. That's I think right. you'd remember, oh, that was a really nice person I talked to. What was her name? You know, and so, uh, and now that happens to me when I get asked and I go, oh God, I talked to that great person. I can say what they were wearing, where I met them, and I can't remember their name. So I just move on. That's right. That's right. Wonderful. You're, uh, you're a veteran in human resources. 34 years, you would say, from 88? Yeah. That's Don't a long time. That. That's a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wasn't the only people that, you know, I was a baby when I came out of college. Right, right. But um, you've seen human resources um, go from a department 
to becoming strategic inside an organization. Today, human resources is a strategic function. Uh, what has changed in the last so many years? What changes, what, what are the most profound changes you have observed organizations evolve human resources? So I think some of the changes has been um, in the past organizations were really command and control led top down. And now people are realizing that organizations need to be led throughout. And so you need to have an engaged workforce who's excited to be there. Mm -hmm. and, and so HR has been involved as people realize, wow, it's not necessarily what service we're doing, it's the people doing that service that is my best and most precious commodity. So I think over time, HR has had more of a seat as they've done more than just the administration, but they've helped do leadership development and do new org designs and help growing organizations manage their talent in right. a way that's super effective. Right. That's great. On that same note, um, you said it's the challenge today is building an engaged workforce. I think that's what every organization, um, every leaders, uh, leader is faced with. Um, what do you believe is the most important quality today's le leaders should have or cultivate to build an engaged workforce? You know, there's there's been a lot of research on this, and I think the last few years with COVID, we've learned a lot, Andrew. Right. And I think empathy. Um, and being a good leader of a team. So those, those soft skills are just as important as getting the results. How do you relate to your team? How do you be a good coach and mentor and lift people? How do you empathize with, with what they need? Do you cover this in your training, soft skill training uh, with others? We do. Uh, can I ask you how long the course is, uh, usually for a month, when you work with leaders and organizations? So when we work with leaders, usually we'll work with either an individual or a top team, and we start by doing some assessments. So we look at a 360 either for the whole leadership team or individually, and then we would do um, put together some game plans. You know, what do you want to work on either as a collective team or individually or both? in the individual and the collective. And then usually coaching engagements run about six months um, that we would help an individual get really clear on how they're going to make some of these behavior changes to achieve their goals, you know, with the organization. And the training is, is um, each organization is different. So sometimes it's a retreat and we go away for a couple of days with the top team. Other times, you know, they can only give us an afternoon, but we figure out how to make the most out of what we've got once we get some results and we know what we're dealing with. Hmm. Interesting. Customized. Um, do you believe today's leaders are, um, I wouldn't say faced with many challenges because I think leaders that, in every generation are faced with challenges of that generation. Um, uh, but do you believe that the, the speed of change, um, the variables, the dynamics of today's environment make it um, a little more challenging for leaders than it was 10 years ago? And what can leaders do to adapt to this? Yeah, so absolutely, Andrew. I mean, I think the speed of change is just, we've never seen anything like this. Like everything mm -hmm. is changing. And right. there's only so fast we can paddle. Like I think of that analogy of like a duck, right? A leader has got to be like a duck. They've got to look calm, cool, and collected on the top. And underneath, they're like paddling. Right. It's easy. There's only so fast you can paddle. And so leadership effectiveness is actually a differentiator. And we, we've done studies and really good, effective leaders um, their organizations perform, have bottom line, you know, NOI and ROI and all of that, um, at least double what a low performing leader, you know, not as effective a leader. So being a good leader, being really effective in all those areas um, helps. And change management is certainly one of the pieces that's critical for leaders. How do you lead an organization through change? We actually are speaking at that at a conference tomorrow in Austin. Wow. 
Wow. A psychological soreness. Does it apply to leaders as well? I think it applies to all of us, right? I think okay. I, I don't know anybody who, who was not psychologically sore in uh, in the last few years, especially. You know, our hearts are hurting. Even as an election day right now, I'm sure there's people experience psychological soreness from, from yesterday. As a coach, what's your advice to deal with this? So as a coach, you know, you, you, it's understanding the root of why you're feeling that soreness and then giving yourself some grace to pause and reflect and decide what you're going to do about it, you know, how you're going to handle it. And so as a coach, a lot of it is is being able to give, give yourself that pause, take that moment to reflect on, you know, what stimulus it is that's got you sore and what your reaction to that is. So one of the things we say is it is that that space between the stimulus and your reaction that is your place for growth. If you can take that pause and really think about it, you know, how you want to react, what you want to do, that's where growth happens. That's very profound. Very profound. Um, great. Um, solvable is about purpose. Uh, we work with um, organizations and individuals and um, uh, inspire them, motivate them, encourage them to keep purpose at the core of what they do. We believe if you have purpose at the core of what you do, um, not just do you experience growth, but a lot of other factors get addressed. Uh, like the cult, you're able to build genuinely authentic cultures. Um, you're able to build trust within employees. You're able to uh, articulate your vision better. Um, as a leader, as a founder, um, and having spoken to leaders across the country, trained leaders across the country, what are your thoughts on purpose? Um, should uh, in organizations embracing purpose and keeping keeping it at the core? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's 101. Leadership 101 is to have your purpose, you know, your vision, your values, those three things help people understand why you're an organization they want to join, why you're an organization they want to stay with. It helps everybody rally around a common cause. So I think it's um, critical. Okay. Uh, a very honest question. How many leaders have you seen um, do this correctly, get this right? And how many leaders do you, I mean, how many leaders do you think get it right out of 10? Out of 10, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, so get it 100% right, you're probably talking 50%. Uh, get it partially right, probably another 25% you know, where they've got pieces of it, right, but they need to either go deeper, define it better, um, say it more often. Sometimes the leader knows it, but they're not communicating it enough or frequently enough or engaging the workforce in feeling that they're part of those decisions. So I think there's 25% that are clueless and just are doing a horrible job. And then the rest are either doing well or trying, and they just need to go a little more. Right. So there's no, uh, you don't see a problem in over communicating this. It's, it's absolutely important. Uh, so leaders should take time to over communicate this if at all required. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Andrew, I think you and I talked about this. I used to say to leaders, communicate it when you're ready to literally just like go, no, no more. Like I've said it so many times, people are starting to hear it for the first time. Hmm. It's like that seven touches I told you when I was just starting, you know, it's the same. You're as a leader, you've got your purpose or your values and you've been thinking about them for a long time. Maybe you and your top team have gone off site and done some work on it. You really have it together and then you roll it out after you've been working on it for six months. So you've had six months to process right. it, think about right. it, and now right. you expect your employees to go from here to here without being able to process it. We call that kind of a Tarzan swing where leaders expect any kind of new thing. They expect people to hear it and then jump on board. Well, no, they need that same time to process and think about it and hear you say it again and again and reframe it a little differently. Wow. 
That was very insightful. It's a, it's a lesson each of us can take when we communicate to our teams. Empathy, I think, plays such an important role. They don't have the same bandwidth, neither did they have the time to process what you just did. So give it time to settle down and, and um, right? Beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, last question, Laura. What's your career advice to employees who are navigating a difficult time, especially the tech workforce being laid off? And what's your best advice to them? So it's still an employee's market. You know, I'm dealing with more companies that are having a harder time finding the right people than I am with people finding jobs. So for employees looking for jobs, I would say um, continue to build your network. You know, LinkedIn, whatever other social media platforms you use, continue to build your network. Talk about what you're doing, what you want to do. Focus on companies that have goals that are aligned with yours, that have good managers that can help train you. Interview there like you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. Interview to see, is this a manager I want to work for, a team I want to be with? Um, you know, I, I think those are some things is really think about, it's a two-way decision, not a one-way decision. So make sure it's the right fit for you. Take the time you need. Um, work it through connection. Getting in, as you and I both know, through a connection is way better than sending a resume in blindly. So work your LinkedIn, work your network, uh, and make it your decision to make sure it's the right job for you. Great. Thank you for that. Loved it. Laura, thank you again for joining us for today's episode of Solve, and uh, really appreciate your time. We wish you and Crowder's team the very best in, uh, in years to come. Thank you, and have a great holiday season. Thanks, Laura.